It's time for a new perspective with your host, Pastor Mike Sherbineau. A word to the wise from someone who's been pastoring people in churches for a whole lot of years. This is the Sunday special edition, but you may be watching on another day because Mike's message isn't only for Sundays, but for every day. Mike brings a host of people together to talk about the complexities of this life, of being a Christian in a world that seems to be going in reverse sometimes, but most importantly, a comfort for your heart, mind, and soul, because that's exactly what Jesus wants for you. From one of his mighty churches just outside of Toronto, here's Mike Sherbineau. Hey, welcome everybody. We're so glad you're with us today on The Perspective. I'm Mike Sherbino, and I'm excited as we've been going through this week, we've been teaching uh, a portion of scripture that a lot of people don't like to go to. And it's in the book of James. We've been talking about anger. Now, I know that none of you ever get angry, but likely you're married to someone or you gave birth to someone who loses their temper at the odd time. So stay tuned. At the end of the talk today, we're going to be talking about some practical ways to identify anger and how to bring it under control. I think it's an important subject. But as we uh, journey into the program today, I am excited by someone who maybe can speak into this subject. I know she's written on all sorts of topics. She's also a Fox anchor uh, person and anchors the Sunday program. Shannon Bream is with us. I am so happy that you're here, Shannon. Thank you for joining with us and just taking the time to talk with us. Pastor, it's my honor to join you. Well, you know, I want to just kind of jump right in. You've accomplished many things. You've written many books. We're going to get to that in a moment. But just give us a little of the backstory. I know our viewers will want to hear it. How you got to Fox News and, uh, and the position that you hold there, which is very influential. You know, I always uh, try to encourage young people. My story is very circuitous. So you never know how you're going to end up where you are, what path God has for you, what plan he has. So it's good to be flexible. Um, I started out my professional life as an attorney and I did practice for a few years after I got out of law school, but it wasn't my passion. My real passion was news and current events and journalism. So I was a lawyer and I started interning and working overnights and weekends at a local affiliate station in Tampa, Florida. <laughs> and I would just kind of do anything they would let me do there. I would bug the producers and reporters and anchors and pick their brains and take notes. And it was sort of my way of getting educated without actually getting a communications degree. I did it sort of in real time. And towards the end of my internship there, I decided to leave my law firm and make this jump into news. And my husband and I had really prayed about it and sought a lot of counsel about it. And I thought, this is the passion God has put in my heart. I want to try to pursue this. And so I went to my boss there at the TV station and said, I'm going to leave my law firm. And he said, no one's offered you a job here. I said, yeah, technicality. I'm, I'm going to step out <laughs> in faith. Uh, and I just felt like it was the step to take. And something opened up there and it wasn't glamorous. It was overnight. I worked 2 a.m. to 11 a.m. And I answered phones and would make coffee. And gradually I started working the teleprompter and writing scripts for the morning anchors. And little by little, I started producing. And that was really the place that I learned the news business from the inside out. And that first boss there gave me a chance several months into it and said, listen, if everybody else is tied up and busy and we have breaking news, we may send you out for a story. So he started letting me go on these stories and these events. Uh, and I was thrilled until the day I showed up and he was gone and his boss was gone. There was a total management change. Well, the new guy was not a fan of my work. And he actually called me in and said, I don't know why anyone put you on TV. You're the worst person <laughs> I've ever seen on TV. And, and where is he today? Where is he today? Where is that guy? He's doing well and prospering, but he, he did sort of kick me out of the nest. And so it took me a long time to find that next job, but I... And I, I knew there was a lesson in that there were months of praying and of asking the Lord for his guidance. And what am I to learn through this? And he taught me a lot of things about humility and where we place our priorities, where we find our identity. But from there, I took a job in Charlotte, North Carolina, then in Washington, D.C. And it was when I was in Washington that I finally got an opportunity um, to work with Fox. They hired me on as their Supreme Court reporter, which I love doing and I still do. And I've hosted various shows and last year became the host of Fox News Sunday. Yeah, that, that is so cool. I just had this picture, you know, when you're learning the ropes uh, back in Tampa, you know, taking one job after another. It's like your hand was like, pick me, pick me. Exactly. <laughs> and, yeah. I'll do it. So did you ever get discouraged? How did you face that? You're human. You must have been. 
Absolutely. You're so right. We all face those paths, those valleys. And certainly when I got fired, that was a big moment of discouragement that lasted for months. And I thought, Lord, did I hear this wrong when we were praying about this, when I thought this is really what you've kind of designed me to do? Did I get that wrong? And luckily I had a lot of support from my husband, among other people. Um, We had prayed and sought counsel, like I said, about that. And so um, I almost humorously sort of tongue in cheek would pray to the Lord, like, okay, I know there's a lesson in this. Whenever there's a valley, there's a lesson. So if you could just tell me the lesson, then we can move on. And we all know that's not how it works. Um, <laughs> we learn, um, like I said, I learned humility. I learned leaning on him, trusting him for whatever the path was. And that's all I can do when I get discouraged is to say, Lord, you know, where are you in this? Help me to trust you when I can't see what the end result is and know that you are working all things to good. Well, Shannon, you also started to write. I mean, writing is part of what you do because a lot of people don't understand that you just get up there and talk, but you've scripted things, you, you work it through. I understand that I script everything I write and then I just kind of fly from the hip, uh, at least sometimes. Sometimes I crash and burn as well. <laughs> don't we all? Talk to us about writing and especially your latest one, which is Love Stories of the Bible. I wanna get into that uh, throughout the program today. Yeah, one of the things um, I thought would be impossible to do, I I still think this about stand-up comedy, I think is probably the scariest thing out there. I could never do that. But I used to think, God, how do you write a book? How do you do that? Uh, And then I had an opportunity to write one, and I thought, well, you just learn as you go. Um, And then Fox came to me um, a few years ago and said, we're thinking about getting into the book business. Would you like to do something in the space of women and religion? We know that your faith as a Christian is the paramount thing in your life. I said, absolutely. What a blessing and a gift. So that very first book we did in the series was Women of the Bible Speak. That that. was followed by Mothers and Daughters of the Bible Speak. And now the newest one is The Love Stories of the Bible Speak. Well, that is very cool. So let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, Love Stories of the Bible. What's your purpose in writing it? And uh, what did it grow out of? I think COVID had a little bit to do with some Mm -hmm. of the impetus for this book. Yeah, it did because we're looking at relationships. The first two books I did were very female-centric, but there were always obviously men as big players in these stories too. And we thought, why not look at some of these couples? Um, Everybody's trying to get relationship advice and find the right person. And the world tells us very different things than maybe um, the you know, the word does and what God does, which is for us to be radically unselfish with people, whether it's a spouse, whether it's a friend, a community member, whether it's a neighbor, this whole idea of love your neighbor as yourself, no exceptions. God doesn't say when they agree with you politically on everything, when they're easy and nice all the time. Uh, no. And sometimes we're the one who is disagreeable and, um, you know, maybe cantankerous with our family or coworkers. So we have to think that maybe we're the neighbor that needs to be loved sometimes too. Um, but COVID, I think, it made us feel very isolated. It hurt friendships and relationships. Um, and people were very bruised by that and still are, I think, recovering emotionally from that. Many people physically, they suffered a lot of loss of loved ones and of livelihoods. And so community is what we were built for. So the book isn't just about love stories, but it's about community, the early church relationships, and again, that loving our neighbors. You know, as you... Talk to me about that. I'm thinking the whole complexity of life. You know, many times we're looking for a three-step program to figure out relationships, complexity. Uh, Later on in the program, I'm going to talk about anger. And anger just can blow relationships apart. Or, you know, we can sometimes be on a slow simmer. And it just, you know, it just builds and builds. And all of a sudden, the thing that attracted us to that person, we lose sight of it because something has gotten under our skin and actually becomes like a boat anchor, doesn't it? It just pulls Mm -hmm. us down. As you're writing, what is going through your mind? Because I know you want to lift people up. Mm -hmm. What are you writing against? Like, what are you trying to expose? Well, I want to remind people that we're all human, including the people of the Bible, short of Jesus and our Heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit. There's no one perfect in this story. And I find that by highlighting stories that are really disastrous sometimes or really take a wrong turn or people are prideful or hurtful or selfish or walk away from God, he's still working in those stories. And we see them many times redeemed when people come back to him. So I want people to think about relationships and not be complacent about them, to know that they need watering and tending. And when we get them wrong, there are ways to heal them and make them right. And even through our worst mistakes and rabbit trails and distractions, God can work when our heart is willing to come back to him. So I want people to feel like they don't have to be perfect and cleaned up and, and no, you know, with no flaws in them to come and have any kind of relationship with God. I mean, 
We would need him if we were perfect and cleaned up. I mean, he wants us to come to him with our baggage and our mistakes. And so I want people to see these real stories and remember that we are all flawed and and God loves us despite that. So cool. Shannon, stay with us. Uh, We're going to be right back in a moment as we talk about some of these stories that Shannon has written about it. You're listening to The Perspective right now. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. So you do have the great love stories in here. You have some messy ones like Samson and Delilah, but I also write about friendships because all of us need that connection and that community in our lives. And really the Bible itself, the overall theme of it is God's love story towards humanity. He loves us unconditionally. We can't earn it. We can't unearn it. We can't get rid of it. Um, He just wants to walk with us and give us the love that all of us are looking for. So I hope you enjoy this. Hey, welcome back to The Perspective. I'm here with Fox anchor, author, and a really nice person, Shannon Bream. Shannon, thanks for being with us today. I've been enjoying the conversation. It's kind of fun. And uh, I'm just trying to see if I can keep pace with you because uh, you're really the (laughs) pro. But you know what? We're part of the family of God, and we go through the ups and downs of life. And your writing uh, inspires me in the whole context is you're unpacking relationships. And that's the heartbeat that I have to say, how, how can I help people do life better? Mm-hmm. What do you think are some of the strong points coming out of your latest book, Love Stories of the Bible? How is it gonna help people do life better? Well, first of all, if we look at the very first people that God created, Adam and Eve, and just knowing that they are in his image. And so I always think if I look around the room and those that I'm going to interact with, that I'm going to work with professionally or or personally or whatever the interaction is, they are made in God's image. Already, I should have at least that respect for them, for their lives, and then knowing that God created them with a very special purpose in mind. So I think when you view people that way, it helps with relationships, whether it's a close one, like a marriage, where you really get frustrated sometimes, um, but remembering they are God's gift to you, or if it's somebody that you disagree with uh, about something that you have a debate or something else. Um, I love what Professor Robbie George out of Princeton always says, you got to walk into conversations with the possibility that you're the one who's wrong. So if we can have an open mind, treat each other with basic respect, I think that goes a long way these days. That sounds like a book on marriage counseling that you should write. Oh, I'm I'm no expert on that for sure. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so Adam and Eve, uh, who else do you talk about in the book? And, And what stands out to you about one of the other couples? Well, I do write about Song of Solomon. And listen, you as a pastor know, um, these are tricky sermons to do. I thought, gosh, Song of Solomon has always been a little bit intimidating to me, but we can't do a story on romance and love in the Bible without talking about this couple. And what it reminds me is that God designed romance and all of those feelings. And he knows as human beings that we're going to be drawn to each other. And here's this couple that is trying to do things right. And they want to get married and be together, but they're very descriptive. Um, it makes me think I've got to up my love notes to my husband. I mean, <laughs> arms like bands of gold, you know, and the teeth like white goats and all of these things we kind of chuckle about it. But it reminds me that we really should invest in in wooing and praising each other. Um, I don't want anybody else to be, you know, bolstering or feeding my husband's um, respect or his self-worth any more than I do. I feel like as his wife, I want him to know I'm his number one cheerleader. So Song of Solomon, though, a little tricky. And I think like in Sunday school as kids, we're like, don't, you can't read that. Don't turn there. And you know, we'd flip around and sort of laugh at it. But it really does have a lot of good practical knowledge for adults. Well, you know, I found out the Song of Solomon, when you're desperate for a crowd as a pastor, preach that book, talk about sex, and you'll just be packed out because people <laughs> oh, yeah, people want to know about it. They say, well, how do we do relationships? And we've got it so wrong. And mm-hmm. media, social media, uh, television, we can always see there's positive, but there's so much negative in the way it's portrayed. Mm-hmm. And not everybody is, uh, we look at people and they say, oh, what a glamorous life they have but they don't know what is spinning underneath. I'm always intrigued with the tabloids to see how many of those marriages break up so quickly, the people that we idolize and follow after. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you talk about those things and you tackle Song of Solomon, so kudos to you. That's, uh, (laughs) I'll have you come and preach that passage at church. There's a lot of praying over that one. (laughs) Do a lot of one. But talk to me about Daniel and his three friends. Where are you going on that relationship? 
You know, that's one of my very favorite stories. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. I remember as a kid, we'd learn a song so we could learn how to pronounce the names in Sunday yep. school. But these men were taken from their homeland. These Israelite men were taken, these Hebrews, into Babylon. And they were going to be retrained, stripped of their heritage, the food they ate, the language that they spoke, the literature they studied, all the things that gave them that Hebrew identity. King Nebuchadnezzar saw that these men were strong and were healthy and were wise and smart. And so he wanted them in service to him. So there were many times along the way they had to decide how far they would go. When it came to example food that was offered before these false idols and false gods, these young men stuck together as friends and said, we're not going to do it, but give us a chance to show you that our God can bless us. And they did this, what a lot of places has now turned into a Daniel fast, where they only ate these specific clean foods and drank water and vegetables. And at the end of the experiment, they were better off than anybody else in this class of people being prepped to serve the king. So um, they were there in so many different important moments when the king was furious and wanted dreams not only decoded for him, but he wanted these wise men to tell him what the dreams were, something that would have been impossible without God's intervention. These friends prayed together and prayed that they would have the revelation that Daniel was then able to take to Nebuchadnezzar. And of course, we know the story towards the end where Nebuchadnezzar has a false God set up. He says, everybody is to bow and worship this golden idol. And these men said, we won't do it. We're not going to betray our God. And they didn't abandon each other. They stuck together. Of course, he throws them into a fiery furnace. He did so hot that the men that threw the men were killed. And while they're in there, he sees them walking around with a fourth, fourth person that many believe, people believe was Christ or um, some you know part of the Godhead. And you're the pastor, so I'll defer to you there. Um, but they had told that king before they went in, we know our God can save us, but even if he doesn't, we will never worship these false idols. They come out of the fire. They don't smell like fire. Not a hair on their head is singed. None of their robes are damaged. And Nebuchadnezzar is forced to say, your God is the real God. So these friends were really, when we talk about people that will walk through the fire with us, that's what these friends were. So if we want those kinds of friends, we need to be those kinds of friends. And I think we see this really deep, strong relationships uh, of friendships and of community modeled in the Bible and, and most especially in that story. You know, I love how you articulated that so quickly and so concisely as you were writing. Um, what was it that you were hoping to communicate to people as you think about these different love stories and not only between a man and a woman, but between people and their God? Um, mm -hmm. What stood out to you as some of the foundational pillars that you want people to hear about? Well, that God loves you without abandon, without condition. He is always pursuing you. I think the Bible as a whole is really his love story about us and about us responding to him. I included a story that I really had to fight to include in the book about Hosea and Gomer, which is a difficult one. Very and about difficult. this prophet, yeah, who was taking on a woman who was unfaithful to him and how he, you know, she goes and she, you know, does terrible things and gives credit to other people for what he's actually provided to her. And really that whole story weaves together with God talking to Israel saying like, you may abandon me and run after other gods or other quote lovers, but I am going to be there to redeem you back. And that's what we saw Hosea do with Gomer, that um, we all want to be Hosea in the story, but often we are the Gomer, the one who runs off and does the unfaithful thing, yeah. um, whether it's spiritually or otherwise. But God is saying, I am redeeming you back. So I feel like his entire Bible is a love story to us about um, the fact that he's waiting there for us. Like I said earlier, we don't have to be perfect and cleaned up. I mean, he wants to meet us exactly where we are and move together in a relationship from that point. Shannon, I just want to thank you for coming on. And we're going to close on that last point, but that's the most powerful point that we can have. And we can be, when we understand it, that truth will embrace us, that God loves us and the extent that he's gone to so that we can have relationship mm -hmm. with him is huge. You've written many books, but this one, Love Stories of the Bible Speaks. I just want to encourage people to get a copy of that at amazon.com and all sorts of bookstores. And uh, we'll be looking for you on Sunday night on the news. So thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. And you too. Hey, stay with us. I'm going to be right back as we continue teaching from the book of James.
I love that song that we've been listening to. It talks about breaking every stronghold. And stronghold might be a word that you're not used to, but it speaks of an area in your life that has you captive, an area that you can't break free from. And Christ is able to do that. And as we come to this teaching on out of the book of James on anger, it can really be easy for us to click the switch and just say, hey, you know, I'm going to deal with this later. Or we can deny what actually is happening in us. And we can deny the impact that we have made oftentimes negatively in the lives of other people because we've blown up. You're saying, well, I I don't do that very often. But what happens in the moments when you do and the residual effect? Those are the things that harms relationships. And you, like me, we want great relationships. But it's so easy for us to come into a conversation thinking, I'm always in the right. And we might not articulate that, but if that is our heartbeat, those relationships are going to disintegrate. Came across a story a long time ago uh, about a young boy who had a real problem with his temper. He was always flying off the handle. And his dad thought that he would teach him a lesson. And he said, every time you get mad or angry, you've got to hammer a nail through the fence portion, you know, three or four planks were together. And the first day, the kid lost his temper 34 times. That's a lot, but it's the reality. And then after the days went by, he began to lose his temper less and less. He he learned to control himself so much so that he came to his dad and he said, dad, he said, I'm no longer hammering a nail into the board. The father said, well, that's great. I want to encourage you. So now every day that you don't hammer a nail in, rather that you don't lose your temper, you can pull a nail out. And finally the day came when he pulled all those nails out, maybe 50, 60, 70 nails. And he said, Dad, he said, I've accomplished it. And he said, that is great. But now he said, I want you to take a look at that piece of fence, those boards, and I want you to look at the backside. And as he looked at the backside, he could see all the holes that the nails had caused. And the dad made this comment. And the reason I've taken the time to share the story is that I believe the story speaks volumes about what happens. And he said, I'm so glad you've learned to control your temper. But as you look at all those holes, you realize all the pain and all the hurt that you have caused that can't be taken back. You can't fix the board. And in life, we can do what we want to try to pull things together. But when we keep losing our temper, when we fly off the handle, there is incredible negative effects. In the book of James, when he says these words in chapter 1, verse 19, he says, My beloved brothers, he's writing with the heart of a pastor. He says, Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. The idea of anger carries three different meanings in the Greek language. It's actually rich with meaning. And as I'm not trying to impress you with my knowledge of Greek, but you know, there are the three words and I'm gonna share them with you. And then I've come up with my own words, okay? The first word is tumas, but I've just called it kaboom. You know what kaboom is like when you lose your anger, the boiling agitation of feelings, it blazes up and suddenly there's an explosion. There's fireworks that are going off, and we know what that's like. And we know that, wow, it catches everybody's attention when that person blows up. Everybody in the room just kind of stops. And uh, when you come into a room, people start to whisper. They start to wonder, do you think they'll blow their cork? Do you think they'll lose it again and again? And we wonder. And the harm that is caused. The second kind of anger is what's called paragismos. And in the Greek language, it's, um, it's the idea of something that keeps provoking you or you provoke somebody else. And you show that to somebody. You show that side of yourself. Now, if the first one is called kaboom in English, I just call that kabugging. And that's my own term. I hope you're not a kabugger. But you know what? You can read into that whatever you want to read into it. But you needle away. You just keep poking away. And it infuriates. Many times, what happens in a relationship, phrases like, I told you so, you never change, you're always like that. It just keeps dragging the person down. Sometimes we want to keep reminding people over and over of their mistakes and their faults. You know, many times when we think about these things, we're saying, that's not me. That's the person I married. Or maybe it's the person you gave birth to. 
it's always easy to point the finger at, at someone else and they just irritate you. I remember there was a lady who did that to us when we were first married. She was our landlord. And uh, you know what? We were locked into a lease and she made life miserable for us. She didn't come across and provide the things that I thought that she would have or that she should have. And it was really tough. And I was never so glad when that lease was over because you know why? She just irritated me to no end. And I had, it was just like, God, you're going to have to help me to bear up. So sometimes people blow up. Sometimes they're just under the skin and just needling away at you. But the third one is this. It's called kazoom. And, and in the Greek language, okay, those are my own made up words, but in the Greek language, it's orge. And orge brings this thought of someone that is locked in for the long haul. It's a lasting attitude that can go on not just for days and weeks, but for months and for years. I've seen that with families where they've just held a grudge. There's been animosity and families can't get together. I recently just heard of a family where they said, you know what, some of the people patched it up, but now a couple other members of the family, they're angry at each other. And my goodness, these people, they're not spring chickens anymore. They're past the age of 70 or 75. And I'm thinking they're going to die and I hope they're going to be in heaven. And if they are in heaven, there's going to be regrets, regrets for the way they behave. But many times if we live that way, how can we actually say that we are the children of God? Do you remember Jesus when he hung on the cross so that we could be right with God? He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And you see, when I choose to forgive someone, it doesn't normally feel good for me. But what I do is I'm releasing that person of what they have done to me. And I'm no longer going to be afflicted by the baggage of those memories saying, I'm going to let it go. What do you need to let go today? And perhaps somebody has hurt you deeply and you need to forgive them and let it go. But could it be on the other side that you've been the one who keeps losing your temper, your anger? You can't get it under control. As you say, Lord, will you fill me with your spirit daily? He will bring the gift of self-control to you. Your life can be changed and people will be happy to come around you. And even the dog will be wagging his tail when you walk in the door. That's how God wants us to go through life. And I hope that you'll trust him to be your savior, your Lord, and your strength. Thank you for listening. And from every one of us at The Perspective, I want to just wish you God's very best today.